Welcome back, friends. Uh, in, our, in our last class, we discussed the administrative law. And today we're going to discuss the structure of courts in Kenya. And we're going to see that there's a specific structure in Kenyan courts that defines the hierarchy of courts. So courts do have a hierarchy and we are going to see this hierarchy. Before we go there, first let us see what the content of today's class is going to be. So in today's class, we're going to discuss the following. So the first, as you can see from my whiteboard behind me, the first is the Supreme Court. We're going to see that it's the Supreme uh, Court of the land, and we're going to see why. The second one is the Court of Appeal, which handles only appeals, and we're going to see how it does exercise that power. We're going to see the High Court, and we're going to see that it has exclusive original jurisdiction over all matters of civil or criminal nature, and even matters of sui generis nature. Then we're going to see the magistrate's court, and we're going to see the kind of jurisdiction that they have in both matters civil and matters of uh, criminal law. Then we also have the court's martial under the Kenya Defense Forces Act, and we're going to see what jurisdiction they have and their composition. And then also we're going to see the tribunals and we're going to see, we're going to look at examples of these tribunals and we're going to see what each of these tribunals has a jurisdiction to do. So now let's uh, head back to see the structure of our courts in Kenya. So the structure of our courts in Kenya looks like this. And so what you're going to see there is that uh, we have the, we, we do have the Supreme Court being the Apex Court. We have the Court of Appeal. Below the Court of Appeal, we have the High Court. And beside the High Court, with the same status of the High Court, we do have the specialized courts. And specialized courts, these are the courts that are under Article 162 of the Constitution. And Article 162 of the Constitution gives powers to Parliament to make laws to enact uh, these courts. So the two courts are the Employment and Labor Relations Court as well as the Environment and Land Court. So we're going to see what jurisdiction they have and how they exercise their powers. Then we have subordinate courts. All courts below the High Court are subordinate courts. Here we have the, all the magistrates' courts, including the Chief Magistrates, Senior Principal Magistrates, Principal Magistrates' Courts, Senior Resident Magistrates' Courts. We're going to see the Resident Magistrates' Courts, the Cadiz Court, so all these are, are subordinate courts, including the courts martial and the tribunals. Now we'll start with the Supreme Court. Now, under the Supreme Court, the relevant provisions of the law is Article 163 of the Constitution of Kenya, as well as the Supreme Court Act. So Article 163 of the Constitution of, of Kenya is the one that gives jurisdiction to the Supreme Court. Remember we had said that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So the supreme law of the land has told us that we have the Supreme Court being the supreme law of the land. So it's one of the superior courts in Kenya, defined under Article 162 of the Constitution of Kenya, where we have the superior courts being the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, and the High Court, and as well as the courts that are specialized courts under Article 162. 
all those are supreme uh, superior courts in Kenya. Now, even though the, we're going to see that even though the high court has exclusive original jurisdiction of all matters of criminal and civil nature, we're going to see that it is not able to legally tackle an issue that is exclusively reserved for the Supreme Court. We're going to see what is exclusively reserved for determination by the Supreme Court. So let's look at jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court, that is under Article 104, 140 of the Constitution, says that a party may file an election petition to the Supreme Court when challenging an election of the president within seven days of declaration of the results by the IABC. So this already gives jurisdiction to the Supreme Court that it is the Supreme Court that can hear matters of the presidential election petition where the results thereof are being challenged. I'm sure you have seen, if not two or three of these, you've seen about four of these in the Supreme Court. And you have seen how they conduct themselves and what the results have been. So the Supreme Court's decision is final and is binding upon the parties. So there's no other court you're going to appeal to in Kenya. So its decision is going to be final. If the court decides that an election was marred by irregularities and therefore it has to be repeated, then it shall be repeated. So we have seen that under Article 140, is that the Supreme Court has exclusive juris original jurisdiction over petitions relating to the election of a president. So what this means, having exclusive original jurisdiction is that it has, it is the only court where you can go as a court of first instance. So it has original jurisdiction. It is not an appellate jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is where you're bringing the first petition to that court. It doesn't sit on appeal on matters or in or matters of a petition relating to the election of the president. Now it also has jurisdiction to hear and determine appeals from the Court of Appeal or any other court or tribunal as may be uh, prescribed in national legislation. Well, if the law says, if national legislation that has not been declared to be inconsistent with the constitution states that the Supreme Court has jurisdiction to hear an appeal from a specific body, whichever body that will be. The effect of it is that the Supreme Court is going to have jurisdiction on and be able to sit on appeal in that specific case. So mainly is that it can hear and determine appeals coming from the Court of Appeal. These are the courts of tribunals that may be prescribed by national legislation. I do not think there is legislation to this effect. Now, I'm say, so we're saying that currently there is no legislation that gives the Supreme Court authority to hear appeals from any other court. So currently there is no legislation that confers the Supreme Court authority to hear appeals from any other court or tribunal that is or post that is not uh, the Court of Appeal. So appeals from Court of Appeal can go up to the Supreme Court as of right in matters where they touch on a point of interpretation or application of the constitution. So where an issue being appealed against or a decision being appealed against touches on a matter, non, a matter under a point of interpretation or application of the constitution, then it can go to the Supreme Court as of right. As of right, that is to mean you do not see, need to seek leave 
in order to appeal to the Supreme Court. That is where it touches on a matter or an interpretation or application of the constitution. So we're going to see where the issue is not of interpretation or application of the constitution. We're going to see how else you can approach the Supreme Court from the Court of Appeal. So we're saying, but if it touches on a matter of general public importance, a matter of general public importance, that it affects the general public, the general public at large is affected, then therefore it has to be certified either by the Court of Appeal or by the Supreme Court. So the kind of certification that is done by the Court of Appeal, if the Court of Appeal certifies that you, now you can go to Supreme Court, then it is that decision to certify is also subject to challenge in the Supreme Court. So in the Supreme Court, somebody can raise an appeal on that issue and say, the Court of Appeal was wrong in allowing us to come to this court. So the Supreme Court also has the power to give an advisory opinion upon the request of the national government or any other state organ or county government. So parliament can petition uh, the Supreme Court to give an advisory opinion on the nature of uh, the kind of functions that they have. So if Supreme Court, if uh, parliament has internal rangos within it, say the National Assembly and the Senate cannot agree on which is the upper house and which is the lower house, then they're going to ask for an advisory opinion. This has been sought in the past and the results have been seen. So even county governments can raise an application for an advisory opinion uh, to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court also has a power to make rules of exercise of its own jurisdiction. So this is the only court that is allowed to make rules that relate to exercise of its own jurisdiction. The Supreme Court may also review decisions and judgments that were made by a judge who has just been removed from office under the vetting of Judges and Magistrates Court Act. So say a judge has been vetted out, and now what happens is that uh, the Supreme Court now has power to call, to recall all those decisions that were made by that judge and see whether the kind of conduct that the judge put into those decisions. And these decisions must be the same decisions that led to this judge being vetted out. So if a decision is the subject of a judge being vetted out under the vetting of Judges and Magistrates Court Act. So now Supreme Court is going to have jurisdiction to review those decisions. So the Constitution will also declare the validity of the following. So this is under Article 152.5 of the Constitution of Kenya in relation to matters of a state of emergency. So the Supreme Court can decide the validity of that declaration where a president has declared a state of emergency. Now the Supreme Court has power to hear or de decide the validity of this declaration of a state of emergency. Also, it has power to hear an extension of a declaration of state of emergency. So the declaration itself and the extension thereof of the state of emergency. And also, lastly, legislation, it, it also has jurisdiction to decide the validity of legislation that has been made as a consequence of the declaration of a state of emergency. So what's the composition of uh, the Supreme Court? Is that it has a chief justice, a deputy chief justice and five other judges. So there should be at least seven judges of the Supreme Court at any point in time. Now, for purpose of hearing an appeal or a petition, the Supreme Court has quorum if it has a bench of at least five judges. We have seen them sitting as six. We have seen them sitting as seven. 
So the current judges are the following. We have our Chief Justice, Martha Kome, our Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Philomena Muilu. We have Justice Mokin Wanjala, as a, another judge. We have Justice Isaac Lenaola, as another judge of the Supreme Court. We have Justice Njoki Ndungu, as a judge of the Supreme Court. And we do have Justice William Oko as a judge of the Supreme Court, as well as Mohammed Ibrahim. Now, how do you become a judge of the Supreme Court, like the people we have named below here? So first, we are going to see that JSC, the Judicial Service Commission, which acts as the human resource arm of the judiciary and the accounting arm as well, is going to is going to first advertise vacancies of the Supreme Court. Say it is a vacancy of a judge of the Supreme Court. So they're going to advertise the vacancy. So the vacancy can be for a chief justice, can be for a deputy chief justice, or merely a judge of the Supreme Court. So they're going to advertise it accordingly and say, we need to appoint a chief justice. So members of the public who are qualified are, appoint, are hereby called upon to apply for the same. So first is that, the, is that the applicant needs to be an advocate of the High Court of Kenya or hold a degree in law from a recognized university or its equivalent in a common law jurisdiction. Common law jurisdictions are those in the Commonwealth countries. So they need to hold a degree from a recognized university or be an advocate of the High Court of Kenya or have the equivalent in a Commonwealth country. Then they need to have experience of at least 15 years as a judge of a superior court. So either you are a judge of the, of the Supreme Court, if you want to become a chief justice, either you are a judge of the Court of Appeal or you are a judge of the High Court or one of these other courts, specialized courts, the under article 162. So you need to be either of these or a distinguished academic. So if you've been a lecturer at some law school somewhere for the last like 15 years or more, then you're going to be qualified to apply for this position. Then there are other requirements like you need to be someone of integrity under chapter six of the constitution. Now, you can also be having been a judicial officer. So even if you were a magistrate for the last 15 years, then you're going to be qualified to apply for this position. By being a legal practitioner, you've been an advocate of the high court and you have been, you, and you have been practicing in your own law firm, for example, We've been practicing in corporate uh, corporate entity, wherever you've been practicing, or you have some experience in the legal field. So you just need to demonstrate that you have experience in the legal field. The JSC is going to shortlist, call for interviews and nominate the judge and recommend that the president appoints that judge. Now at that point, if the judge is supposed to be a chief justice, then it requires approval of the National Assembly. Upon being approved by the National Assembly, all the president does is a ceremonial duty of swearing these people, appointing these people in, so that they now become sworn in. Now, we're going now to look at the Court of Appeal. We're going to look at the Court of Appeal. And we're going to see that in the Court of Appeal, this is a court that decides matters on appeal. It only sits on appeal. It has absolutely no original jurisdiction over anything. Now, let us look at a little history of this court. So up to 1977, there was that East African community. And the East African community provided for the East Africa Court of Appeal, which was the final appellate court from the Kenyan judicial system. So from the Court of Appeal, from the, from the High Court, 
you had your final decision being taken at the East Africa Court of Appeal. So it was the final court under Kenyan judicial system. And it was also the final appellate court in Uganda and in Tanzania. Now it was constituted of the president, vice president and three other judges who were appointed by the various heads of states in the other three countries, that is Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. So they, those, they were member, they were the member states of the East African uh, community. Now, in addition to this, the chief justices of the high court of the three countries were like ex officio judges of the Court of Appeal. So the, the, the East Africa Court of Appeal. So they were never appointed as judges of the East Africa Court of Appeal, but they were ex officio in the manner that by virtue of the positions that they held, by virtue of the positions that they are held, now they became judges of that court by ex officio nature, by virtue of the office that they held. Now the court only sat on appeal in both matters of uh, civil and criminal nature. So we have said court of appeal is a court that sits only on appeal. Now the Kenyan court of appeal came around because on 28th October 1977, President Kenyatta assented to the constitution of Kenya Amendment Act and of 1977. And now the effect of this is that the amendment provided for the Kenyan Court of Appeal. And this was after the collapse of the East African community, which also collapsed the East Africa Court of Appeal. So East Africa Court of Appeal has decisions that have affected uh, persons in Kenya. And if you look at case law citations, you'll see EACA. That means East Africa Court of Appeal decided those cases. Now, at the time, the law provided that the chief justice would be one of the judges of the Court of Appeal. So at that point, the person in Kenya who used to be the chief justice would be the, would also be a judge of the Court of Appeal. And now he used to sit alongside two other judges. Now the current Court of Appeal is provided for under Article 164 of the Constitution of Kenya. So we have seen that the Supreme Court is provided for under Article 163 of the Constitution of Kenya. And now we are seeing that Article 164 provides for the Court of Appeal. And Article 165, as we're going to see, provides for the High Court. I prescribe that there should be a minimum 12 judges, as may be prescribed by an Act of Parliament. Now, the organization and administration of the Court of Appeal is normally provided for by an Act of Parliament. And the Court of Appeal uh, requires a president. This is a constitutional office, and he is elected by judges of the Court of Appeal. He or she is elected by the judges of the Court of Appeal. Now, he, the Court of Appeal has power to hear appeals from the High Court and from any other court or tribunal that may be provide as may be provided for by an act of parliament. So if you have a case in high court and you get a feeling that you that the decision was not reached in a manner that is correct, so your point of appeal is supposed to be now the Court of Appeal. Now the Act, now Article 164 says that Parliament should provide an Act that prescribes the powers of the Court of Appeal. So that Act is the Appellate Jurisdiction Act. It is what gives the Court of Appeal the power to hear cases. Now the Act has indirect legislation in the, as we had discussed, is that there is subordinate legislation which can be passed by another body aside from parliament. And now we're going to see that this body is the court, this body formed rules referred to as the Court of Appeal rules. So they are subsidiary to the Appellate Jurisdiction Act. Now the Court of Appeal rules uh, provide the procedure for the court and the Appellate Jurisdiction Act on the other hand gives it power to hear and determine appeals. 
So there is the procedural law, which is the Court of Appeal rules. And then there is the substantive, the Appellate Jurisdiction Act that gives them power to determine here and determine the appeals. Now, who are the judges of uh, Kenyan Court of Appeal as of today? Let us see who are the judges of the Court of Appeal of Kenya as today. Yes, we have it there. So we're going to see, we have Justice Daniel Musinga as the president. We have Justice Wanjiru Karanja, Rosalind Nambue, Hannah Okwengu, Mohamed Warsame, Patrick Kiage, Gatembu Kairo, Sankalo Lekantai. We've got Kathurima Minotti, Agnes Murgor, Fatuma Sichale, Jamila Mohamed, Mbogoli Msaga, Asike Makandia. Helena Monde, Francis Tuiot, Justice Jesse Lesit, Mumbengugi, Pauline Nyamwea, and Imana Laibuta. So these are some of the judges of uh, the Court of Appeal in Kenya. Now that we have an idea, let us uh, now proceed. Now to the High Court. Now the High Court, we're going to see that it has exclusive original jurisdiction on matters of civil and criminal nature in the Republic of Kenya. So it does have both appellate and original, it has exclusive original jurisdiction and it has appellate jurisdiction in specific instances. So for instance, if you have an issue with the tax appeals tribunal, you're going to raise it with the High Court. So in that case, when you're raising it to the High Court, it is going to be an issue that comes to the High Court under its appellate jurisdiction. Now the High Court of Kenya is provided for under Article 165 of the Constitution of Kenya. Now, in order to give effect to the Constitution of Kenya, there was a requirement for legislation. And that legislation is the High Court Organization and Administration Act, which was passed in the center two on uh, 15th December, 2015, it became operation on 2nd January, 2016. Now the High Court's jurisdiction is that it's exclusive original jurisdiction of all matters of criminal civil nature, except those matters that are reserved for the Supreme Court. So where the Supreme Court has exclusive jurisdiction, then Court of Appeal cannot claim to have, the High Court cannot claim to have jurisdiction over the same issue. So the High Court cannot rely on having exclusive original jurisdiction to now state that it has jurisdiction over an issue on election of a presidential uh, election petition. It cannot hear that because the constitution says it has exclusive original jurisdiction over all matters except what is reserved for the Supreme Court. So this is the example. And the other exclusion, the other exception is that it cannot hear matters ex exclusively reserved for specialized courts and Article 162. So if it does hear that, all those proceedings will be analogy. So the, the specialized courts are those, Employment and Labor Relations Court and the Environment and Land Court. So it cannot hear, the High Court cannot hear matters that are specific for that court and specific for the Supreme. So, and specific for the Supreme Court. So it will not be able to hear those. So the specialized courts and matters of Supreme Court, those uh, the High Court cannot hear those. Now, the specialized courts, are courts that have a status that is equal to the high court. So they have a, an equal status to the high court in terms of rank, but they cannot be referred to as the high court. So if you're going to employment and labor relations court or the environment and land court, 
you cannot say that you're going to the high court. The rank is the same. The quantification of the judges are the same, except you cannot refer to them as the high courts. They are not the high courts. They are specialized courts. So technically speaking, the courts can even hear cases of very low values. We're going to see why the courts are not, the high court does not hear matters of very low values. We're going to see why. So they can even hear petty matters from anywhere in the country. In fact, they are not supposed to say they do not have jurisdiction. So if you take a case to the high court and it thinks it's a very, very low value that it doesn't need to hear it, or they think that a subordinate court has jurisdiction over the matter, what they're going to do is that they're going to transfer it down to the other court. They're going to transfer it to the subordinate court for it to be heard at that point. And it's wiser for it to be heard there so that the party is afforded a right of appeal to now the high court. So they can even hear petty matters from anywhere in the country. But we're going to see that in practice, they're not going to hear every other case. What they're going to do is that if a case has been brought to it and they think that it should be had by a subordinate court, they're going to refer it there. So it's a purely administrative thing, which has found itself uh, in law and practice, that matters of civil nature that do not meet the threshold of 20 million are had by subordinate courts. So we're going to see this when discussing the jurisdiction of a subordinate court. We're going to see why matters that are below 20 million or 20 million and below are going to be had by the subordinate courts. So uh, matters like an offense of murder is specifically limited to the high court. So the subordinate court cannot hear such a case. Still on the high court, so it has jurisdiction to hear and determine whether a right of fundamental freedom appearing in the Bill of Rights has been denied, violated, or infringed. So matters of, matters of the Constitution, matters of human rights, these are matters that are taken to the High Court of Kenya in the first instance. It also has jurisdiction to determine an appeal from a tribunal formed for the removal of a person from office. So, but there are exceptions. The exception is that if some, the person who has been removed from office is the president on grounds of incapacity, and that's called 144, then they are not going to hear that uh, appeal. So the High Court also has jurisdiction to hear and determine questions of whether an action taken is in tandem with the constitution. So where an action has been taken and you wish that it be declared unconstitutional or inconsistent with the constitution of Kenya. So what you're going to do is that you're going to approach the High Court of Kenya. Now the High Court in other stations will be having the Constitution and Human Rights Division. So that is where you're going to take it. Or the Judicial Review Division. That is where you're going to take such uh, matters. So some of these are whether an act of parliament or some other law is in tandem with the Constitution. And this includes even a bill for amendment of the Constitution. Whether a decision taken is in tandem with the Constitution, if the CS Health says today, that everyone is supposed to be vaccinated or they will be denied government services. So you're going to see whether this is inconsistent with Article 27 that requires everyone to be equal before the law and that no one should be discriminated against on any ground, including on grounds of health. Now, a matter relating to the constitutional powers of state of organs and the county governments and the relationship between the two levels of government. So if there's an issue between the relationship between county governments and national governments, that issue has to go to the high court. Now in this case, constitutional doctrines do apply. So separation of powers does apply. Supremacy of the constitution is going to apply. The rules of natural justice are going to apply. 
Also questions of conflict of laws. So which law are we going to apply? Are we applying Kenyan law? So there's a contract and people are not sure, are we going to apply Kenyan law or are we going to apply Ugandan law, considering probably a contract was signed between Kenyan and Ugandan nationals. So when such a question arises or something happens in the high seas, when it is not clear which, the law of which country is supposed to be applied. So this is going to the, court, the high court. Also where legislation confers its uh, original appellate jurisdiction, it is going to have jurisdiction over that matter. So one example you're going to see is that the Tax Appeals Tribunal Act provides that where you have an appeal from a decision of uh, the Tax Tribunal, Tax Appeals Tribunal, is that you're going to take it now to the High Court. So if it's Nairobi, you're going to the Commercial uh, Tax and Admiralty Division. So it also applies where a question arises, it has jurisdiction where a question arises that asks a substantive question of law. Also on the question of denial infringement of a constitutional right or fundamental freedom under the Bill of Rights, or a question where an action is constitutional or not. So the question is whether an action was constitutional or not. So on all these issues, that question can be determined by a bench that is constituted by the chief justice. And this bench will need judges of, of an uneven number. So an even number is not going to be one. It's going to be at least above two. So that is at least three judges. So in any event, they need to be of an, an even number. So if the question is whether the BBI is constitutional or not, then the chief justice can appoint a, a, a bench, can form a bench that is going to hear this case because it asks a substantive question of law. And it is a question of whether an action is constitutional or not. So for the first three, whether it's, it raises a substantive question of law or a matter of denial and infringement of a constitutional right or fundamental freedom, or whether an action is constitutional or not. So this, can be the subject of an application to the chief justice to tell the chief justice that this matter requires a bench of at least three judges to hear it. Now, the High Court also has jurisdiction to supervise the subordinate courts and tribunals that exercise judicial or quasi-judicial functions except for superior courts. So quasi-judicial functions are those functions that relates to resolving of a dispute, but the person doing the resolution is not a court in, the, in that sense, in that a very exact sense. So in, in the case of say uh, a tribunal or a commission that decides a matter, a tribunal or commission that decides a matter that and, and people's rights are affected decides the fate of a person, somebody is being removed from office. So these courts are going to have power. The high court is going to have a power to supervise those tribunals to the extent that they exercise a judicial quasi-judicial function. Now, they're not going to supervise any court above it. They're not going to supervise the Supreme Court. They are also not going to supervise the court of appeal Now, the High Court has power of review in the sense that it can call for a file relating to all these matters that we've talked about. The file for the rent, a file for a rent tribunal can be called, a rent restriction tribunal can be called by the High Court. So the High Court can call for the file of the rent restriction tribunal, for example, or tax appeals tribunal. And the purpose of calling for this file is to satisfy itself whether a fair administration of justice was taking place. And in which case it realizes that the same did not happen, 
it is either going to make a decision on the same or refer it back for a better decision to be made. So it's important to note that the, the High Court of Kenya at Nairobi, there's a way in which it conducts its businesses. So what it does, it has divided itself into divisions. So let's see some of these divisions. So the civil division, High Court civil division for civil matters that are not in the, in the sense of family matters and are not in the sense of commercial matters. Then there's a criminal division that hears all criminal appeals and criminal cases. So it has jurisdiction over both, both uh, original, original jurisdiction over criminal matters and appellate jurisdiction over criminal matters. Then there's a family division relating to matters of succession, matters of child maintenance, matters of divorce. So those will go to the family division, either on appeal or as a court of first instance. Then there's a constitutional tax and admiralty division. So that is the, uh, that is, that is the body. So there's a constitutional division, which is different, separate from the tax and admiralty division. The tax and admiralty division is the commercial division of the court. And then we have the constitutional and judicial review division. Then we have the specialized courts and article 162. So the specialized courts are the Environment and Land Court, as well as the Employment and Labor Relations Court. Now the constitution provides that parliament should pass legislation to give the two effect. Now the kind of legislation the parliament has passed over this, number one is that is the Employment and Labor Relations Court Act. And number two is the Environment and Land Court Act. Now these specialized courts, beginning with the Environment and Land Courts, it has jurisdiction relating to the following. So it can hear matters of environmental planning and protection, matters of climate, land use, title. So climate, land use, title, tenure, boundaries. So title relates to who owns the property. Tenure relates to you're owning the property in what sense? Is it on a leasehold tenure or is it in a freehold tenure? In a leasehold is that you're owning it for a number of years for a determinate term, say 10 years, 20, 50, 99. Then the, 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 the freehold tenure is the one that you are holding it forever. It belongs to you absolutely. So the court has power to hear matters of tenure. There's a question of boundaries. Though initially you're supposed to go to the registrar for determination of the boundaries before you go to the court. Now matters of rates, you're supposed to pay land rates. Rents, matters of land rent, valuation. So where property is undervalued or overvalued, then these matters, if an issue arises over here, you take it to the specialized court uh, in the name of environment and land court. Now we have matters of mining, minerals and other natural resources. All these are supposed to go to the Environment and Land Court. Then there's an issue of compulsory acquisition of land. This is where one thing you need to understand at this point is that the state has a radical title to people's land, to all the land in Kenya. So all they, all they do is that if they do identify your land and believe that there is need to use that land for public purposes, all they need to do is compensate you. And there's a procedure for that so that they're able to demonstrate that they're using it for a public function. And therefore it is your land that they need. So they're not able to compensate you or relocate you to another land of equal value. So that, so in such matters where an issue arises, it has to go now to these specialized courts. There's the matters of administration and management of land, matters of public, private, community land, 
contracts in land, choices in action, or any instruments granting enforceable interest in land. Then also any other disputes relating to environment and land, then it needs to hear those. And now one thing you need to know at this point is that, is that the subordinate courts have been given some amount of jurisdiction so that they are able to also hear some of these matters subject to their pecuniary jurisdiction. So they can hear some of these matters relating to land subject to the value of what that land is. Now we have the Employment and Labor Relations Court and it has jurisdiction to hear uh, the following disputes. Uh, matters arising out of employee employment that is employer employee any issue arising there of somebody has been his contract has been terminated in a manner that did not follow the termination required under the employment act then that will go to that court also matters between employer and a trade union that needs to go there also so the trade union that most of us are able to point out and the employer is uh, the kind of dispute that arises between the TSC and the teachers unions. That is not in compared. I think most of us are able to identify with that. So all those issues are supposed to go to that court. Also matters between an employer's organization and a trade union's organization. So employers are also allowed by law to come into a form of employers organization where it is only employers who are the members. So if an issue arises between an employer's organization and a trade union's organization, then that issue is supposed to go to that court. Then matters between trade unions themselves, if trade unions are having wrangles, then they need to go to this court. Then matters between employers organizations on their own, so you can see how they flow, the employer's organization first, where an employer's organization is having an issue with a trade union's organization, then they can come to this court. Where trade unions themselves are having issues, they can come to this court. And where they're having a dispute between em employer's organizations, then they can go to this court also. Now between an employer's organization and a trade union, then they can go there to that court. Then between a trade union and a member. So if a member of a trade union is having a dispute with the trade union itself, then they can go to this court. There's also between an employer's organization or a federation of an employer's organization, they can go to that court. Then matters concerning registration and election of trade union officials, then those can go to that court. And also an issue relating to legislation, registration and enforcement of CBS, that is collective bargaining agreements. Teachers have agreed have come to a CBA with a, a TSC. Then registration is supposed to take place so that it now becomes enforced. So registration is going now to the Employment and Labor Relations Court. Now, we're going now to subordinate courts. And subordinate courts, we have said these are courts that are subordinate to the high court. Now, under subordinate courts, we're going to even look at tribunals, and we're also going to look at even the courts martial and Cadiz court, all this being subordinate to the high court. Now, according to Article 169 of the Constitution, subordinate courts are the following. One is the magistrate's court, two is the Cavis court, three is the court martial, and any other tribunal except the one established under Article 162. So all these are subordinate. And parliament is required to enact legislation to confer jurisdiction over, the, of, over all this. So all this come under some act of parliament. We're going to see this. So we're going to see this legislation that has been passed to confer jurisdiction over these courts and tribunals. 
Now, starting with the magistrate's court. Now, the magistrate court has a civil jurisdiction, civil and criminal. So we're starting with the civil jurisdiction. Civil jurisdiction in the sense that the court can hear civil matters where the value of the subject matter does not exceed the following. So if it's a contract for anything more than 20 million, you go to high court. Anything below, you are at the magistrate's court. And we're going to see that chief, the chief magistrate is going to hear matters between above 15 million up to 20 million. From anything above 15 million to 20 million will be heard by a chief magistrate. And matters between that are above 10 million, above 10 million and of not more than 15 million, these are going to the principal magistrate. And any matter above 7 million, but is not of more than 10 million, will go to a principal magistrate. And any matter above 5 million, but is not above 7 million, will go to a senior resident magistrate court. And any matter from zero shillings or one shilling to 5 million will go now to the resident magistrate. So the lowest rank, so this is the rank for magistrate courts. So the jurisdiction is 5, 7, 10, 15, and 20. So beginning with the resident magistrate at the lowest rank, senior resident magistrates, uh, principal magistrate, senior principal, and the chief magistrate. So from chief magistrate, if you ever get any promotion, now you're going to become a judge. Now, over still to magistrate court. Now they have criminal jurisdiction that is conferred under the criminal procedure code or any other written law. So if any other written law confers them jurisdiction, then they do have jurisdiction. So jurisdiction is the power that a court has to hear a case. Now the civil procedure code provides that a chief magistrate, senior principal magistrate, principal magistrate or senior resident magistrate. So from senior resident magistrate going up to chief magistrate, they can pass any sentence authorized by the law. But a resident magistrate can only pass a sentence under section 278 that is still in uh, stock and they can give a sentence for, for 14 years. That's section 278 of the penal code. Then there's section 308 of the penal code where section 308 one, where preparing to commit a felony, they can give a sentence of between seven to 15 years for that. Then there's section 322 of the penal code, handling stolen property. And also they can hear matters under the Sexual Offenses Act, where sentences range up to life imprisonment. Now, uh, now we are with Cathy uh, Scott. We're going to see what kind of jurisdiction they do have. And we had looked earlier, we had looked at uh, Islamic law as a source of law. And we had seen some of these provisions. That's, these are provided for under Article 170 of the Constitution of Kenya. So the Cathy's Court is also now the Act of Parliament that confers the Cathy's Court jurisdiction. So Article 170 says that Parliament should come up with a law that confers jurisdiction over the Cathy's Court. So the Cathy's Court is Act, uh, is Cap uh, 11 Laws of Kenya. And this court has jurisdiction of matters relating to the following. So personal status, marriage, matters divorce, and matters inheritance, only those. So they do not have criminal jurisdiction. All they have is jurisdiction to hear matters relating to personal status, marriage, divorce, and inheritance. So if they do hear a matter outside of this, then all those proceedings are going to be annulled. So this applies where both parties profess. So this is where both parties profess Islamic faith. So both of you have to be Muslims in order to approach this court. And that needs to be proven, or at least it needs to be uncontested or admitted. Now, the rules of evidence that apply are the same as those under Muslim law. 
So where Muslim law provides for a rule of evidence, that rule is going to be applied by this court. Uh, witnesses are supposed to be heard without discrimination on grounds of religion. So if you're a witness, but you do not profess Islamic faith, you're not a party to the case, you're just a witness, but you do not profess Islamic faith, then in which case you're supposed to be heard without being discriminated upon on the ground of religion or any other ground. Remember, this court is a constitutional court and it applies the constitution as the supreme law of the land. So the constitution in Article 27 provides for non-discrimination. So which is why this court insists on this, that you can be had without discrimination on grounds of religion or any other ground. Now, we have a question here. So which would be the appropriate court to go if one of the parties involved is not a Muslim, but the other is a Muslim? So in this case, you're going to look at the nature of the dispute at hand. So if the dispute is one that can be had by the magistrate's court, you're going to the magistrate court. If it is a matter that has now to be had by the high court, now you're going to the family division of the high court. Now, in this court, the judicial officer taking control of court proceedings is a Kathy. Now, a Kathy is someone who professes Muslim religion and has knowledge of Muslim law applicable to any of the sects of any, any of the sects of Muslim. So some of the sects are as follows: the Sunni, Maliki, Hanafi, etc. There are many more uh, sects of um, Muslim. Uh, uh, law. Uh, next, now we have seen everything about Kathy Scott. Now let's go to tribunals. Now tribunals, this one usually have the jurisdiction uh, stipulated in an act that provides for them. So if we are talking about tax appeals tribunal, there is a tax appeals tribunal act, which now confers its the tax appeals tribunal jurisdiction to hear matters of a specific nature. So it is going to tell us what kind of matters are these that the tax appeals tribunal can hear. The rent restriction tribunal, we're going to see that from the rent restriction act. So we're going to see what the act says is supposed to be the kind of jurisdiction that is provided for for that court. Now, an examples, the examples are tax appeals tribunal. This is just but a few. The political parties disputes tribunal, rent restriction tribunal, uh, business premises rent tribunal. These are some of the examples. So there are many more. They can be found at the Kenya Law website. That is uh, www.kenyalaw.org. Now let's begin with a few examples and see a brief, briefly see what jurisdiction they have. Now the pre business premises rent tribunal is under section 11 of the Landlord and Tenant Shop, Hotels and Catering Establishments Act. It's CAP 301 laws of Kenya. Now most people say CAP 301 because it's a very long uh, name of an act. So jurisdiction that they have, one is to protect tenants from eviction that is not legal and also exploitation. Now, it also has the decision to ensure that the landlord gets returns on its investment. So while on one hand, they do not want you to get evicted in a manner that is arbitrary. So what they are going to do is that they are going to ensure that even you, while you're saying you don't want to be evicted, are you giving the landlord a return for his investment? So that is one of the role of the tribunal. So they're going to ask you whether you paid rent, even while you're talking about eviction, they're also going to ask you why, where, whether you're paying rent and why you're not paying it. They also, they need to do a timely, they, they need to facilitate a timely hearing and determination of tenancy disputes. So they need to facilitate a timely hearing 
and determination of tenancy disputes in control the tenancies. So in, in matters, so it only has jurisdiction in matters of uh, control the tenancies. And now uh, they need to facilitate a timely hearing, which is why they are a specialized tribunal for that purpose. So if all these cases were going to courts, then there would be a heavy backlog in courts and they, there wouldn't be a timely hearing of the same because the same person hearing all these other many other matters would be overwhelmed at some, at some point. So it is the reason why a specialized body is doing a hearing of this. Also, another purpose is to create a conducive environment for business to thrive. Also to handle termination of tenancies in business under control tenancies. To issue orders leaving distress in uh, business premises. So in this case, you require you require to be given leave of the tribunal in order for you to levy distress for rent under the distress for rent act. So you go collect uh, the kind of items that you think uh, you can sell to pay rent. So to undertake rent assessment of uh, businesses under controlled tenancies, that's another purpose. Now over to the next tribunal, uh, the rent restriction tribunal. So business premises rent tribunal that we have already discussed is in relation to shops, hotels, catering establishment, and basically business premises. Now, what we're looking at now is rent restriction tribunal. This is now the one in relation to not commercial properties, but now to residential properties. And this established under section four of the Rent Restriction Act, uh, CAP 296 of Kenya, which has the decision to determine disputes between landlord and tenant for dwelling houses whose standard rent doesn't exceed 2,500 shillings. Also to make provision for regulating the increase of rent. So you do not just increase rent the way you want. So the unit, they provide, they need to make provision for how rent can be increased. And you need to justify why you, a landlord need to justify why he's increasing rent for the, for the premises. Then the right to possession, ex, ex, exaction of premiums and fixing of uh, standard rents in relation to controlled uh, residential premises. So these are those below the rent of 2,500 shillings. Uh, there have been issues relating to these 2,500 shillings in the sense that if all the matters they were hearing were for rent below 2,000, that doesn't exceed 2,500 shillings, then what, what, which houses are these that uh, people are paying below 2,500 shillings? So there'll be very few of them. So in some cases, the tribunal will hear cases, even if the rent is uh, much more than 2,500 shillings, which is a thing that is a, a subject of some law review and the act is uh, about to be abolished. Now, uh, they can also look at all other purposes, all, all, other, all, all other things incidental to this and connected with the landlord and tenant relationship in a dwelling house. So they also have jurisdiction to resolve disputes between landlord and tenant uh, in controlled tenancies relation to, relating to service charge. So service charge, these are those services that a tenant pays for for the other services that they, that they enjoy in the property. So uh, money for garbage, for example, money for security, uh, money for water, all these are what falls under service charge. There's the issue of repairs of the house, a uh, recovery of rent arrears. So where you haven't paid rent for a while, recovery, so actions for recovery of rent should go there. Refund of deposits, yeah, this is a serious issue between uh, our landlords and, uh, and their tenants, refund of deposits. Then there's matters of eviction. So you shouldn't be evicted without an order of this tribunal in recovery of possession of a house. So somebody has refused to get out of the house and the landlord wants to recover his house. So somehow they need to go to the tribunal. 
The matter of assessment and determination of standard rent of uh, residential premises, this uh, need to go to that tribunal. Also, they have jurisdiction to investigate complaints where the provisions of the Rent Restriction Act have uh, not been met. Now, we're still on tribunals now. Let's look at now the... Now, let us look at the political parties disputes tribunal, that is the PPDT. So this one is another example. It's under section 39 of the Political Parties Act. And the jurisdiction it has is between political parties and their members. So under section 40 of the Political Parties Act, the Political Parties Disputes Tribunal is supposed to hear uh, disputes between uh, a member of a political party, a member of political party and that political party, also a dispute between political parties. So it can hear di disputes between members of a political party where the political party is not even a party to that dispute or where a member is suing a political party or a political party is suing the member or where political parties are suing each other. Then it can also hear an independent, it, can, it also has the decision to hear an independent candidate and a political party. So someone is an independent candidate, but some political party probably is infringing on his rights or uh, a political party has a member who has decided to become an independent candidate, yet they still uh, probably have some form of uh, dispute between them, then they need to go to this tribunal. So this, you do not take them to court in the first instance. You begin at the tribunal uh, level. So there's coalition partners. So if uh, part partners of a coalition are having an issue, uh, a party has been given money to divide between members but there are smaller, smaller players in the coalition are not receiving any amount of money or the amount they're receiving is not in tandem with the kind of agreement they had, pre-election agreement, then they need to go to this tribunal. Then appeals from the decisions of the registrar of political parties under the act, so they need to be had there, appeals from the decision of the registrar of political parties. That's refused to, the registrar has refused to, uh, the registrar has probably refused to register you as a, as a political party, or has registered you without your consent, as some people were. So then you need to appeal at this point to this tribunal. Then disputes arising out of party primaries. So party primaries are those that uh, parties undertake to decide who their candidates are. So if you think you are the preferred candidate that you are voted for overwhelmingly, but at the point of at the point of giving party members a certificate that they are now the member to run for that political seat, then you, you realize it your opponent is the one who's been uh, handed the certificate, then you can go to this tribunal and uh, raise your dispute over there. Now we need to look at the last tribunal, that is the tax appeals tribunal. And the tax appeals tribunal is under section three of the tax appeals tribunal act. And what happens is that where the commissioner, the commission of tax, where the commission of tax raises, makes a tax decision, says you're supposed to pay KRA this amount of money. So the law provides that you're going to respond to that and the commissioner is going to make a decision out of it. So the commissioner might say, you're still unable to pay it. Now, when that decision comes, then now you need to go to the tax appeals tribunal to raise that issue because now it is a dispute that has been uh, heard by the commissioner. So the tax decision will now be taken now to the commissioner of tax. So if your tax obligation, if you think the tax obligation that has been raised against you is not what is required under the law, 
then you are able to approach then you're going to be able to approach this tribunal so that they hear the appeal arising out of the tax decision. So once this matter goes now to the tax appeals tribunal, the tax appeals tribunal is going to hear both parties. You're going to hear the appeal and see whether it has merit. So at the end of the day, the decision of this tax appeals tribunal itself is since it is subordinate to the high court, it is also now subject to appeal to now the high court, in which case now you're going to approach the commercial and tax division of the high court. So at this tribunal, you can be represented either by a tax agent or an advocate of the high court of Kenya. Then we have our uh, second to last uh, body that we're going to look at under subordinate courts. That's the courts martial. So the courts martial is under the Kenya Defense Forces Act. This is for members of the forces. So it is established. Uh, so it, it hears matters of uh, establishment offenses. Uh, so it, it, it provides for so the act provides for the establishment of that court. So it says that there shall be a court referred to as the court's martial, and it refers to the kind of offenses that arise for determination by a court's martial. It also provides for constitution of the court. So who are the members of this court? Who are going to sit in this court? Who are the kind of witnesses? What is the kind of procedure that is going to be used in the court's martial? Then it also provides for appeals. So where do you appeal from a decision of this nature? So you appeal to the high court. And therefore, which is why we are saying it is a subordinate court. Yes, so we have come to the end of uh, this class. And now uh, the next class, we're going to discuss alternative dispute resolution. Uh, and I'm your lecturer, Derek Mooma. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. So any question regarding this class uh, may be sent to that email, directmoma5 at gmail.com. You should be able to get an answer in real time when you send it to that email. So that is the end of our class. And uh, so what we have discussed today is the structure of courts in Kenya. We have looked at the Supreme Court the Court of Appeal, the High Court, the Magistrates Court, the Courts Martial, and all these other tribunals. We also even looked at the Cadiz Court. So that is it about our class today. Let us meet in the next class. Uh, thank you for listening in today.